Our next speaker is Brother Daniel Denham. He'll be speaking to us on Strengthen Your Hope of Heaven. Daniel was born in Pensacola, Florida back in 1956. He is a graduate of the Bellevue Preacher Training School when William S. Klein was the director and one of the teachers. He's done mission work in Taiwan, and served as an evangelist in local work in the states of Florida, Texas, Tennessee, and Virginia. And he currently works with the North River Congregation in Parrish, Florida. He's authored a couple of tracts and numerous articles for Brotherhood Publications. He has also authored chapters for sundry lectureship books. He's married to uh, the former Barbara Stancliffe, and they have three children, Sean, Trevor, Megan. Megan's with us today, and they have two grandchildren. We're very glad to have him with us, and something he didn't put on here, but most of us who deal with him all the time know that he is somewhat of an authority in the Greek language, and uh, we appreciate that. That comes in very handy to the rest of us many times, and I've said this numerous times, but if I'm going to debate somebody, I like to look either to the left hand or the right and see Daniel sitting beside me. He's a great help in the debates we've engaged in, and uh, we appreciate his work for the Lord. And I want to say this one thing. I had asked Michael Hatcher to introduce you. He is nowhere to be found. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I'm here and he's gone. Come and speak to us on Strengthen Your Hope of Heaven. Michael's just a coward. <clears throat> Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> We're honored with the opportunity to be with you and to uh, be a part of this lecture program again this year. Always love and appreciate this congregation, your stand for the truth, tremendous job you continue to do your eldership, and, of course, Brother David Brown, uh, just an outstanding gospel preacher. It was a privilege to serve with him in those debates. And we've been trying, brethren, to get some others. But I think he did too good a job on some of them, and the result is you can't get some of these guys to agree to debate anymore. Uh, at any event... Uh, you, we just about would have them close to agreeing to something and they'll back out when they learn about the format and what they're going to have to go through to try to prove their proposition and uh, the nature of the propositions we're going to affirm and, uh, just falls through. Anyway, we love and appreciate him and each of the speakers on this program your soundness in the faith, this good congregation and let me say I greatly appreciate the Tremendous repast we had just a little while ago. Lasagna is one of my favorites. Uh, having had a great uh, grandmother who was full blood to Sicilian Italian, uh, who could make great lasagna. Uh, so uh, that is a quick way to my heart and to my weight. <laughs> I lost 15 pounds uh, over the Christmas holidays deliberately by practicing self discipline. And I think I've already gained eight of it back. <laughs> anyway, our study this uh, afternoon is strengthening your hope of heaven. We need to understand and appreciate the Bible doctrine of heaven. It is the uh, really what we're here for, what it's all about. If there is no heaven, then everything is for naught. Uh, our desire ought to be to go to that place which is pictured in the scriptures as a place of rest and peace and joy and blessing and uh, eternal happiness and a place of worship, a place of service, a place of uh, great accomplishment on behalf of our God and uh, where we'll be with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit personally for all eternity. That ought to be our desire and our aim and what we're striving for every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every year of our lives. Heaven ought to be our focus. <coughs> 
the Apostle Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians chapters 4 and 5 to the church at Corinth, was writing in defense of his apostleship. And he discussed the ministry which pertained to his apostolic office. He emphasized that he had not and would not quit. He thus affirmed, as we have received mercy, we faint not. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. He then described the suffering that he, that, uh, he had been called upon to endure for the Lord's sake as part of his ministry. That's in verses 8 through 12. Turning his attention then at the end of chapter 4 to the great source of the strength and comfort that enabled him to face those very hardships that he was enduring, and that was the hope of heaven. He wrote down in verses 16 through 18, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly and great and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, that is, the physical things, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The opening clause to this paragraph reads in the New King James Version, Therefore we do not lose heart. There was, a song, there was a song uh, many years ago. I'm not going to give the name of the play that it's uh, from. But the song was, You've Got to Have Heart. The Christian has to have heart. And Paul is stressing the need for us not to lose our heart. Paul's argument is quite simple. And yet it is eminently profound. Like the Lord, Paul was a master logician. He says, because we know that the purpose of our mission and the end result of that purpose, we know what it is, we are ready to press on to the end of this life. He knew that suffering would accompany his efforts to save others and that this was his primary mission. He knew that the devil and all his emissaries would do what they could to discourage, disrupt, and demoralize him in his effort. And that, they, and that the devil was active in doing so in the life of every faithful uh, child of God. Christianity has always had its virulent enemies who are set on its destruction and to the frustration of its cause and purpose. That was true in the days of the Apostle Paul. It's true in our day. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, that there are indeed many adversaries, many enemies, that we have to deal with. Evil has rarely suffered from deprivation of numbers to do its bidding. And that is always a frustration to us in the Lord's church. We're looking for volunteers. We're looking for warriors. We're looking for servants. The devil, they seem to come in droves for him. And that always causes some degree of demoralization. And so we face a powerful enemy, an enemy that hates us, an enemy that is seeking to destroy us every hour of the day through any means at his disposal. He doesn't play fair and he doesn't intend on playing fair. The devil knows no bounds as far as what he will do and how far he will go to seek to destroy us. And uh, we're facing this implacable enemy, and yet at the same time, in a very real sense, the victory is already ours. The victory has already been gained. It is simply up to us then to hold on in this life to remain faithful unto death or until the Lord comes, whichever occurs first, in order to gain and enjoy the full benefits of that victory. It is though the Lord from the bastions on high is calling down to us and crying out, Hold on, be faithful, be steadfast, be stalwart, continue to fight, Fight until there's no breath in you. 
I'm coming. Just hold on. And that's where we are. And that's what we're dealing with. John says that uh, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. We're going to look at that more in a little bit. And so if we'll hold on to our faith, and we will strengthen our faith, and we will build upon our faith, we can be there to enjoy the victory parade. Have you ever looked at 2 Peter chapter 1? You have the Christian graces that we're to build on, that we're to add to, add to, to, add to our faith, virtue, and so on. And then, as Peter goes through there, he describes the result of having these graces. If you have these things, you'll not be barren or unfruitful. In other words, you'll be productive. Finally, he gets down to the point that if these things are in you and abound, you will have an abundant entrance. Look at that phrase, abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom, talking about heaven. All that heaven is, all that heaven holds. You'll have that abundant entrance. The phrase that is used in the original text hearkens to the language of the triumphant marches that the Roman people and the Greeks and even the Jews were familiar with in their day. When a general was triumphant in battle and when a nation was victorious, they would celebrate by marching their captives and uh, also the captured uh, uh, booty and, and uh, goods and so on, the spoils of war. And they would erect monuments and would have uh, a, a great parade. We've had those in similar fashion as a result of uh, World War I and World War II, particularly World War II with the... Uh, Surrender of the Germans in Europe, and then following that, the surrender of the Japanese in the Pacific. This is the kind of victorious language that the Lord, that the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use in describing the entrance of the Christian into heaven. It's as though it's going to be a victory parade. Triumphant march. And we need to recognize that, appreciate that fact, and then do what is necessary to be part of the parade. There's an old saying, everyone loves a parade. But there will be no greater one than that of the righteous entering into heaven in eternity. And no one more important. The answer to the trials and hardships of life is simply this. It is the focus that we must put on heaven and the need then to strengthen our hope in heaven. The very first principle that we begin with that is so important toward that is that of faith itself. As we said, 1 John chapter 5 verse 4, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. About 20 years ago, in the uh, lectureship at, uh, in fact, it was actually uh, in uh, 1987, I believe, the very first lectureship, Firm Foundation lectureship in Chattanooga. A survey was done among the speakers of that program as well as others who were present, other preachers and elders. And the question was raised, what is the most pressing need in the Lord's church today? The answer then is really the same answer that, is to be, that should be given now. The need for greater faith. It's always the need. I believe it is the lack of faith that, or the, uh, the failure to have proper faith that is uh, spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11 as the sin that does so easily beset us. That is uh, the sin of unbelief, disobedience. And it is the root of all of our other problems. Why do we have problems with false teachers running rampant in the brotherhood? Because we do not have brethren that have enough faith, by and large, who will stand up and tell them, Hush, we're done with this. 
We need elders who have the faith to face false teachers and say, that's it, no more. You're done. We need gospel preachers who will stand up and preach it just as it is and not change it one whit. We need deacons who will get up and do their job and carry out their responsibilities as God has intended them to do. And we need members who will not just sit in the pews and amen, they will actually back up solid, sound gospel preaching and godly elders doing their work. <laughs> Brother Joe Gilmore on that occasion responded this way. He said, we need elders that eld. We need preachers that preach. We need deacons that deek. And we need members that mim." Brethren, that's what we need. We've got jobs to do. We've got responsibilities laid out. If a business is to succeed, every individual in that business helps that business to succeed by doing the job that he holds. We have a work to do. Ephesians 4 verse 1, we have a vocation and we're to walk worthy of that vocation, that profession wherein we have been called. And it's not an easy vocation, by the way. It is difficult. It, is, it involves trials and hardships. Paul's dealing with that in 2 Corinthians. Brother uh, John West was discussing that when he uh, described in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, the kind of life that we're to live in dedication to Christ. The work is difficult. The trials are hard. And oftentimes, individuals suffer greatly, even sometimes to the point of death. They're actually killed in the line of duty in serving the Lord. But you know, as difficult as the job is in being a faithful Christian, especially in an ungodly world and an ungodly age, and we are living in an ungodly age, despite all of that, there's no better job on the face of planet Earth than to be a faithful child of the living God. As one brother used to say, Brother George Darling used to have this phrase. He said, you know, the work is difficult. He said, but the retirement plan's out of this world. And that's what we have to be looking for and working toward. And it begins with faith. That's the foundation. That's what undergirds our hope according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. There is a sense in which faith itself becomes evidence. If it is based upon the, the, if that faith is based upon the testimony of God's word. Knowing that we have both the internal and external evidence that demonstrates it to be what it claims to be. The all inspired, all sufficient, inerrant word of the living God. And as a result, I can know that I know that I know there will be a future resurrection of the righteous dead. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians 4.14. And so here in the Bible it affirms the righteous are going to be raised. They're going to go to heaven. That's part of the, the message and if that's the Word of God, and I can prove it's the Word of God, I can demonstrate it logically, I can demonstrate it uh, abundantly to be that, then I can know that what it is teaching is true. And I've got a basis then to face every trial and hardship and every hate and hell we can stand up to. Brethren, We've got to get rid of this pusillanimous, weak need, spineless, oh woe is me, the devil's got us on the run attitude that we see in the Lord's church right now. Brethren are quitting and giving up at the slightest challenge. And it's a problem. It really is. We see members every day in every congregation Oh, I lost my job. Yeah, it's a terrible thing. Been there, done that. Bought the t-shirt several times over. Let me ask this. How many of you preachers have ever been fired? If you've never been fired, you ain't worth your salt. <laughs> that's, what, that's what old Gus Nichols said. He said, brethren, if you've never been fired at least one time, you ain't worth your salt. 
You're going to get fired sometime. You got to stand up and still carry on. Not give up. Yes, we get depressed. We get down hard. We get uh, demoralized. But I want to say something here about what we just recently went through. I'm going to tell you, we had some good brethren who encouraged us through that. Some right here in this congregation. Some of them are sitting right here in this audience. And even though they've had their hardships and trials and difficulties, they were there to help lend a word of encouragement or help to do what they could to help us. We got through it. Brethren, we've got to work together. We've got to fight together. We've got to stand together. We've got to stand shoulder to shoulder together. And we've got to win out together. If you are going to go to heaven, you're going to have to go to heaven with someone else. You're going to go to heaven with their help, and you're going to go to heaven helping them to get there. That's the very nature of Christianity. It's the very nature of the system that we have. And we must have greater dedication. We must have greater faith in God that he will bring us through regardless of what we go through. And regardless of the trials of this life. Our faith must rest upon the firm foundation of the word of God. Because it is by that word that faith comes. Romans 10 verse 17. And without that faith we cannot please God. Hebrews 11 6. We must have full confidence in the authority of the Bible, as uh, Brother Hightower was dealing with earlier today. We must recognize and, and, and be able to discern Bible authority for what we do and how we do it and why we do it. We must recognize that the supposed antagonism between faith and knowledge is a false dichotomy. That it is a false antagonism. They are not at odds with one another. And uh, I have a discussion in the manuscript don't have time to deal with today concerning this idea that science and, uh, and, uh, and faith in God are two separate categories and uh, institutions and, and never the twain shall mix. Uh, that's simply a false concept that has been sold to religious people to get them to shut up against the evil of evolution. That's the whole purpose of it. Is simply to uh, lower the opposition to evolution. Because the atheist knows if he can get you to believe in evolution. Then he has made God unnecessary. And it's simply a matter of coming to that realization at some point in your life. I have seen so many young people whose faith has been destroyed. Because it began with the supposition evolution is true, which is absolutely false. Faith is not assuming something to be true and then acting on it as an assumption. It is acting in accordance with our knowledge of the word of God, which we also know to be true. It is taking God at his word and doing what God said do simply because God said do it. That's what biblical faith is. You want the directions to heaven? Brother... Roy Deaver used to give them this way. He said, it's turn right, go straight, keep going until you get there. That's it. Just keep on. Get it right. Stick to it. Stay with it. And as a result, you'll enjoy the victory that faith produces. You also have the provisions of grace involved in this. Paul stressed to the Corinthians that all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, 2 Corinthians 4.15. The all things refers to the provisions that God has made in his divine government on behalf uh, of us relative to eternity. First, it clearly included the work of the apostles themselves and the difficulties they endured to bring the gospel to places like Corinth. The very definition of grace we say unmerited favor, loving kindness, has to do with every provision that God has made, is making, and yet shall make 
for the ultimate well-being of those who trust in Christ and obey Him in that faith. It involves the provisions that He has made and is making. And that includes the work of the apostles, the inspiration of the scriptures, the scriptures themselves, the various benefices and blessings that are brought about through the scriptures and our obedience thereto. Paul had been discussing his own suffering and how this was endured for their sake. Notice, he suffered, they benefited. That was God's grace at work. Yes, Paul suffered, Paul went through hardships because of it. But God was able to work with the situation and bring about good results. In quite vivid language, Paul described himself as, and his companions as bearing about in their bodies the dying of the Lord, verse 10. And he referred to the fact that death worketh in us, that is, in him and his companions, but life in you, by contrast, that is the Corinthians. The point is this, the difficulties and hardships that Paul endured were ultimately for their sake. These provided through God's grace, charis, that is, unmerited favor, loving kindness, the opportunity for the salvation of the Corinthians. In God's providence, Paul and his companions had come to Corinth. By the way, we got some folks called Deverites that say we don't believe in providence. Hogwash. Anyway, Paul and his companions had come to Corinth despite all the adversities they endured to preach the gospel and provide in turn opportunities for the Corinthians to be saved and go to heaven. Often the opportunity for blessing was accompanied or even occasioned by suffering on someone else's part as well as sometimes even on the part of the ones that were blessed. The nature of cause and effect relationships entails the possibility of suffering from natural calamities, but also there is that suffering that is brought upon the righteous servants of God by forces that oppose God's ends and purposes. Satan, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, is active in opposing the work of the Lord. We need to understand that. He will use anything and anyone at his disposal. But God is able to use the suffering that Satan brings upon the saints actually to further his plans rather than to thwart them. When God's people are determined, key word, determined to persevere despite their trials and hardships, souls will be saved, theirs and those whom they influence for good. God's loving kindness is thus able through His providence to work all things out for good. That's exactly what is under consideration in Romans 8. Particularly verse 28. All things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. Paul is not saying that all things are good. He is saying that all things work for good. All things can be worked out to that end. And in verse 31 he adds, If God be for us, what? Who can be against us? The answer is nobody. Not effectively, not ultimately, not to the point of our destruction. And that's what this is about. In Romans 8, he is dealing, by the way, with the, with the importance of hope and the place of hope uh, relative to our salvation. We'll get to that in just a moment. Just as in Hebrews 11, we have that great chapter on faith. And in 1 Corinthians 13, we have that great chapter on love. Here in Romans 8, we have that great chapter on hope. And those three are seen over and over again in each of those three chapters. Intertwined and upholding and encouraging one another. Faith undergirds our hope. Our hope in what? What lies beyond this mortal coil? All that heaven is and all that heaven holds. That's what's involved in it. And we need to recognize and appreciate that fact. Further, the all things that God provided for them also included the assurance of the coming resurrection of the righteous dead, 2 Corinthians 4.14. Paul declared that God would raise him up, raise him and his companions up 
and present them with the Corinthians at the resurrection. That implied that the Corinthians themselves, that is, those who had been faithful, would be raised up as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, 16, 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. There is coming a time of general harvest in the last day when the resurrection of both the just and the unjust will occur. But Paul is especially focused here on the resurrection of the righteous dead. God's able to raise up uh, by him who conquered death uh, those who trust in him. For a third thing in this regard, among the things provided by the grace of God is also the daily renewing of our inward man. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Terry Hightower himself is proof that the outward man is in the process of perishing even at this present time. Despite how well he may try to cover up himself with makeup, <laughs> with frou-frou juice, and all sorts of other stuff, however, however miles he may walk, run, crawl, whatever, to build up his body, his poor, pitiful little frame will one of these days <laughs> give way in death. That, that's just the truth of it, Terry. Don't, don't take offense. You could be in worse shape. You could be like... <laughs> okay. Anyway, our physical bodies are wearing away. That's just a fact. The second law of thermodynamics is at work. Ladies, your husband's go on a trip. And you go into a room. And guess what? The room's dusty. It gets dirty. Your husband's not been in there. You can't blame it on the poor fellow. He hasn't been. He's on a trip. Well, what's the culprit? It's called thermodynamics. There's dust in the air and it's going to settle. There's all sorts of other things. Things are wearing out. That lampshade you had that looked so good 20 years ago, it doesn't look nearly as good now. Age is taking its toll on it. It's wearing out, wearing down. Our world is wearing out. Our physical bodies are wearing away. There is a real sense in which we were born to die as far as physically uh, is concerned, the physical aspect of humanity. But our spirit is renewed. The inward man is renewed day by day by the word of God that strengthens us and encourages us, that renews our minds and thus our spirits and lives, Romans 12, verse 2. A fourth provision that is made by the grace of God is the proper perspective that we can have to help sustain us in difficult times. Paul wrote in regards to this renewing of the inward man. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What is he saying? Concentrate on the spiritual matters. Concentrate on those things that are of eternal significance. There are some people who spend more of their time polishing their automobiles than they do studying the Word of God. Now, I'm not against polishing automobiles. But there is a matter of priority. There are some people who spend more time trying to find out who was the, who, like we used to say years ago, who shot J.R., trying to think about and mull that over and solve that mystery than they do studying God's Word. Now, where are we? We need to prioritize in these regards. We need to put first things first. And a proper perspective is that our focus should be on eternity and not on the here and now. We are strangers and pilgrims in this land. But we should, as Brother Gus Nichols used to say, be careful that we don't fall in love with the campground. And I'm afraid that's what's happened to many of us. 
It is appointed unto all men once to die, but after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, verse 27. And so we need to be looking beyond this life to something greater. Each of these provisions was made possible by the grace of God would help stabilize and strengthen the Corinthians as they dealt with many temptations so prevalent in their wicked city and the vicious persecutions that eventually would, they would face. Here was a city that had the temple of Aphrodite of Pandemos, over a thousand temple prostitutes who would walk the streets and on their sandals a mark would be left in the sand as they walked along an imprint from their sandals would read, follow me, encouraging men and women to go to the temple to commit ungodly acts, particularly homosexuality, bestiality, and, uh, or bestiality. We say bestiality, it's actually bestiality. Bestiality and other uh, such ungodly uh, acts. They were dealing with that. They were having to confront that. And that's the background to both of those epistles. The early saints went through some 12 major persecutions, including that of Nero, which was about to commence in Rome. These provisions are always needful. If it was needful for them facing that, it's definitely needful for us. But never more than in the face of brutal persecution. These things sustained the saints who suffered dungeon, fire, and sword for the Master's sake. The arena and the cross of crucifixion saw many who perished outwardly, but who inwardly were sustained by the loving kindness of their God. Finally, look at the power of hope. In looking at the things which are not seen, we are exercising a disposition and an attitude known as hope. The earnest and happy expectation of what God holds in store for those who love Him. The Christian is to put his hope in that which lies beyond the veil of this life. He must look beyond the things that we see with physical sight and with the eye of the mind look toward and upon those things unseen by physical sight. These things are just as real as those which are seen. They simply pertain to a higher and better realm and this is what the materialist simply cannot grasp. One cannot literally see the wind, but the effect of it is nonetheless so manifest we do not doubt its reality. The same is true of the spirit realm. We see its effect every day, even if we try to ignore it. When people reason and draw conclusions, the fact of the spirit realm is implicitly affirmed. As thought is surely a process higher than just the materialistic functioning of chemical processes of the human brain. When people change their mind, when they accept conclusions or opt for other conclusions than those previously held, and so on, they are implicitly affirming the fact of the spirit realm. The attitudes of love, mercy, kindness, compassion, altruism, all testify to the existence of the spirit realm. For purely material things of themselves know nothing of such virtues and place no value upon them. In a purely materialistic worldview, every act is morally neutral. It has no virtue. It has no demerit. It is simply a, materialist act, a materialistic act driven by materialistic processes without any innate or inherent value beyond that which the materialist derives in the form of animal pleasure to such people. Physical sensation is all that matters. If you want to get a, drive an atheist crazy, and we're doing it right now on the internet, one after another, is to tell him when he writes to you, why in the world are you an atheist who believes that all that we are is matter in motion, trying to reason with people in order to get them to change their mind, when your materialistic philosophy implies they can only draw the conclusions that materialism demands they draw. Now think about it. If thought is simply the work of biochemical processes, if that is what constitutes human thought, 
then the ability to reason is simply an illusion. We simply think we're thinking. We're not really thinking, according to the atheist. And then, stress this fact. With every sentence they write to try to argue their case, they are actually proving the Christian's case. And that makes them furious. They cannot answer it. They cannot deal with it. Sam Harris wrote a book of over 100 pages. He's their new philosopher-in-chief of the, the new atheism. He wrote a book on free will in which he comes to the conclusion free will really doesn't exist. But throughout the book he's trying to prove, and get this Terry, he's trying to prove that and convince you to change your mind that free will does not really exist. Well, if it doesn't exist, you couldn't change your mind to start with. You're only going to draw conclusions that the biochemical processes make you draw. Why then write a book? Absolutely absurd. And that's where we are. We are saved by hope. Romans 8. 24 and following. And we need to recognize the importance of it. People who have hope, and especially that hope founded upon fact, upon truth, upon what is right and proper in the sight of Almighty God, as Paul says, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. Thank you. Didn't do quite as good as John did. I think we got seven seconds out of you. <laughs> I think with the atheist that it's much like the late Brother Bales when I had him in school years ago would say about all of the stuff that atheists try to bring up. The sad part about it is he came to marriage, divorce, remarriage, he did some of the same thing. <laughs> is that he said, well, you're just simply throwing dust in the air and then complaining because you can't see. And a great many arguments simply satisfy the person who didn't want to believe in God in the first place, and what he's doing is just uh, fortifying himself. We appreciate those words that take us beyond the material, take us beyond what can be seen through sight, and that remind us that the Christian has a view of things, if it's anchored in the truth of the Bible, that nobody else has. It is food that others who know not the Word of God and have confidence in the God through that Word, they cannot have because we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, since faith comes by hearing the Word of God, then we walk as the Word of God leads us. When you prove the Bible to be the Word of God, then it becomes proof for anything else and it's proof that there is an afterlife there is a spirit there is a heaven and there is a hell and the whole reason for this lectureship the reason this building stands here and all that we do if we're what we ought to be is because we want to go to heaven there's nothing else that matters there's a lot of places we want to go in this life we don't get to some places we wish we never had gone <laughs> And uh, one place I wish you hadn't gone, though, and I don't know whether my wife will hear this or not, but when you talked about the dust settling, <laughs> and I'm in my easy chair, and she now has ammunition to get on to me further to get me out of it, because <laughs> she'll be just like the dust settling and won't get up, that's the way she'll put it. <laughs> so we have a bone to pick with you a little later. But right now, we'll stand dismissed for about 10 minutes. Thank you very much.